Thanks everyone. We're about to get going with the Q&A. Uh, before we do that, I'm going to, or as we're doing that, I'm going to pass around the infamous Burning Books collection basket. Whatever you put in here helps us make this kind of stuff happen next time. Um, and it allows us not to charge a set fee at the door so anyone can come in anytime, whether you have money or not. So if you can, if you can contribute, we much appreciate it. Uh, and here's more. Thank you. All right, where did the hardcore and this one's eager to go? <laughs> I missed the whole talk. Did we do? That's your fault. Cut the throat of your oppressor. <laughs> <laughs> Why didn't you say that in the first time? <laughs> go for it. All right, now, on the, I guess to, to add to what you were suggesting, Oh, well, um, well, what I can say is, the next time we go out on the throughway, join us. Uh, yeah. The bottom line is, is just as Ward was suggesting, everything that you fight for is something that is inherent in who we are. And and if you ignore what we're going through, and I know it's really easy for people to say, ah, the Senecas they don't need anything, they, they've got casinos. The things that we fight for have less to do with, with a, a casino. It has to do with native to native trade. Those folks in Pine Ridge would not be living in, in abject poverty <laughs> if native to native trade was uh, was not being opposed by every individual state and by the federal government. That's a, a big part of the things that I talk about on my radio show. It's a it's a big part of the thing that I that, that we fight for. I don't I don't give a rat's ass about gaming. I don't particularly care for cigarette smoking, <laughs> even if Ward does it. But, but I'm gonna defend our yeah, well, I'll share. Uh, I'm gonna defend our right to be in those businesses. Any business. Any, any business. You know, and, and, and the thing is that is that, that uh, encourages me about coming down here with, with Nate and, and having teamed up with Nate on a couple of things already, even having been on my show, and, and, and then seeing this group of people here is, you guys need to stand with us and understand that when we spill out on the throughway, it's about standing up for the very things that, that uh, you were supposed to believe in. And so, don't leave us hanging. Join us. That was the proverbial engraved invitation. <laughs> you know, so, there you have it. And I'm not feeling greatly professorial, so somebody wants to jump up and... Rant. Oh, I don't know. Rant? Let's leave that to... John Boehner? <laughs> do, do you have any ideas on how to get these people out of prison, the people from the 60s? Troubled in turbulent time. Well, <laughs> if I had ideas that I knew would work, they'd be out. You know, perseverance, staying with it, is the only recipe I've got for that. And. You lose a round, you come back. And it's really important to the people who are in that keep coming back. Because in my experience, which does not include being one of them, it's immensely important to morale to think that there's some process happening that has even remote potential to get them out of that box, out of that cage, back into society. Without that, <coughs> so maintaining efforts and maintaining contact, sport networks, actually sometimes sending somebody a candy bar can be really crucially important. They can arrive at the day when the bottom was just arrived. And the bottom is easy to reach in these contexts. I don't think anybody has not visited people in a maximum security prison or been in one can really begin to fathom what it's like in those places. And to be sitting in there for years, sitting in there facing what amounts to eternity in a lot of cases. <coughs> 
it takes a lot to offset that so that you've got the strength to keep going. I mean, we've got a victory of sorts right now. Lynn Stewart is coming out. But Lynn Stewart's coming out kind of like Marilyn Buck did. She's coming out to die. She may not die, and I hope that she doesn't. <coughs> but that's why they're cutting her loose. Because she has terminal cancer, and because as it stands, they pretty much got to keep her in isolation work away from anybody else because her immune system is so depressed by the chemo and such that putting her into any kind of population runs a risk of triggering her death on their on their watch. And so out she's going to come. I don't know how, how many of you even know who I'm talking about, although she's right over there on the cover of a pamphlet. She is an attorney who drew 10 years for carrying communiques from a client out and releasing them. It's, Entirely. That's called material support and terrorism. She was uh, an exemplary case. I mentioned Marilyn Buck. Well, the best description of Marilyn probably came from members of the Black Liberation Army who proclaimed her to be the only white member of the Black Liberation Army. That's who she was. And she lived less than 30 days after she came out. She was that terminal. But that's a, a person coming out. They have held people in until he dies. Yes, sir. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah. I'm not sure that that was adequate answer. I mean, it's the best answer I've got. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Just maintaining the con contact and, and the effort. Yeah. Uh, lately, there's been some conversations going on around <coughs> Buffalo and around the country concerning Michelle Alexander's new Jim Crow. Mm -hmm. and, and it's engaging a lot of people, including middle class white people, like uh, coming upon revelations that really is not revelation for a lot of people who've been, you know, you know checking stuff out. But uh, have you read the book? And, and did you have to speak for that? I have not read the book. Okay. I read, I think, about two chapters in the okay. book thus far. It's not because I'm not going to read the book. I just haven't read the book. I've had preempting things that I needed to do by way of reading. The thing that struck me, I mean, it's what I've read of it, it's very, very cogently, very well argued, very cogent, plays it out clearly. I can't find Indians in there anywhere. You can't find yeah. Indians. American Indians, oh. indigenous people. I mean, I'm used to getting left out when they do the, the census for non-white groups. Blacks, Latinos, and Asians. Yo. <laughs> well, I consider that part of the white power structure. I find it rather more problematic when somebody who is of a progressive sensibility writing from a community of color on that experience and the impact of it does exactly the same thing. So that, that's my criticism. That's not to detract from the information that's in the book. It's to say something about there ought to be a little more information in that book, don't you think? I heard her speak out of Hamilton College about a month ago. Well, she's doing better than me because I didn't get to speak at Hamilton College. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. Maybe, maybe we can arrange that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good luck with that one, pal. <laughs> but uh, it seems that, that her. Uh, the, the, the basic thesis is, is like very powerful and, and also appealing to people who are ordinarily not involved, you know? And I'm sure, I'm sure she's aware of the Native American situation and the type. But maybe I think she was just kind of trying to focus on basic stuff getting out to people. And, and she excluded Native Americans, shame on her. But, you know. Yeah, I was going to say, this is somehow or another not basic stuff in your mind? I mean, that was kind of revealing. It is in mind. Yeah. You might want to quit while you're ahead on this one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. But, yeah, I, you talk about uh, first priorities, native people and stuff, but also I'd like you to kind of delve into the idea that, that we're the miners' canary. That huh. I, re I remember in 1974, I was working for the Department of the Interior and I opened up a newspaper and it said that uh, 
AIM was the number one domestic terrorist organization according to the FBI or whatever. I was really proud of that. <laughs> and then there was COINTELPRO and then all those things. And uh, that things that are used against native people are then used against other people like COINTELPRO and so on. Yeah. And that one of the things of engaging with native people is to find out what's being done see, in terms of government activities and some other things. And war is a classic example. He's about the only person that got his tenure ranked, yanked, because uh, he said things people didn't like, you know? And that might be the miners' canary. See, in that oh, area as well. Academic misconduct, Don. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote things for other people. They put their name on it, and then I cited to that and supported my own writing. And that's kind of what David Petraeus did last I heard <laughs> before NYU hired him as a full professor. Uh, I guess kind of a slippery definition on some of these things. But yeah, I did that. I wrote things for other people who weren't particularly proficient with writing. They put their name on it and put them on their feet. This would sort of suggest they agreed with it. So when I cite them, I'm citing somebody who concurs with that. That is their position. That doesn't seem to be especially fraudulent to me, or at least it wasn't when Petraeus did it for his commanding officer for the uh, Army War College. It was, it was a journal that was published in and helped found uh, Count coin, as they call it, counterinsurgency doctrine for an entire generation of uh, U.S. military. That's what they train them. Well, when all politicians have speechwriters. Yeah. But the miner's canary thing, those of you who don't know, that actually comes from Felix Cohen. Felix Cohen wrote the uh, Handbook of Federal Indian Law when he was, what, Solicitor General for the uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs during uh, the Roosevelt administration, a long time back. And one of the people on my committee claimed to be a co-author of that. I kept looking at him. He didn't look like he was old enough to have been a co-author of something written, published in 1941. In fact, he's younger than me. But hey, you know, there's misconduct and there's misconduct. Yeah. Cohen probably forgot more about Indian law than most people in the United States of legal profession will ever know. And that was a point that he made, that Indians function socially as a sort of miner's canary. You know about the miner's canary, that back in the old days of shaft mining? Yeah, they used to put the canary in the cage and hold it on a cane pole out in front. If you hit methane gas, the canary is going to start to flop around. If humans breathe it, they're going to die just like the canary, so the canary's death saves the humans. That's the idea. All right. So you can look at what happens to Indians and see it as being a preview of what it's going to be that happens to everybody else. Well, back in 1982, I had an interesting experience that goes exactly to this. Sometimes, you can drive that point home, or the feds drive it home for you. This, I either mentioned when I was talking, or I mentioned when I was doing an interview earlier today, and it's real hard for me at the moment to separate one from the other, because I kind of went back to back. But in Pine Ridge, with the American Indian Movement, during the mid-1970s, they were running death squads. The goons. I know I mentioned that. Those are mostly composed of Indians who are working for the government, for the tribal government and for the federal government. But you also had these gaggle of white vigilante organizations, mostly members of the John Birch Society, <coughs> who were performing the same function. And you had about 70 Indians that I could document who died at the hands of these folks. There were probably more that I have documented. Actually, the FBI said about trying to rebut <clears throat> what Van der Waal and I had compiled and they added two names to the list. <laughs> you know, I haven't even been aware of these guys. So, well, the Rough 70, that's 
who the uh, Charles Mix County Rangers were, for example. That's what they called themselves. That's one of the particular groups. All right. That's 1973 to 1976 when this is operating. 1982, we were engaged in a land occupation less than 20 miles outside Rapid City, South Dakota. Minkani is GTOSPI, which roughly translates as Yellow Thunder Camp or Yellow Thunder Community. And we've taken an 880 acre parcel. The U.S. Forest Service announced that that was the first step recovering the Black Hills, which are still owned by the Lakota under the 1868 Fort Laramie Treaty. They had not accepted payment. Basically, we're operating under the uh, slogan, sometimes slogan speaking can be good, Black Hills are not for sale. Okay. All of a sudden, a couple guys from the Charles Mix County Rangers, they owned the fact that they had been part of that that they had been part of the vigilante organization. We're still members of the Bird Society. They showed up and said, we want to help you. This was a real interesting moment. <laughs> Long story short, I ended up in a bunker that night with these two guys and a journalist from West Virginia by the name of Joe Bajan. It was real good. Okay. And they're pointing weapons out the bunker towards what the feds were threatening to be a, an assault to clear us off this particular patch of land. We struck up a conversation. Nice get kind of long sitting in a bunker, whether it's in Southeast Asia or in South Dakota. What, what's the story with you guys? I said, well, we figured it out. We got more in common, interest in common with you than we do with the feds, who we were working for or working with, in any case, five, six, seven years ago. And the cut line on that is the feds have come up with something called the Etsy pipeline plan. They'd opened up this humongous open pit coal mine very near the South Dakota border in Wyoming called the Wildak Mine. And they figured out that the most cost efficient way to get it from the mine site to where they figured to consume it, and that was in the Midwest, it was not on rolling stock, but rather a large pipeline they were going to slurry it through. In other words, they're going to pump enough groundwater to literally wash this massive amount of coal on a sustained basis from eastern Wyoming to Milwaukee. All that water is going to have to come out of the Ogallala Aquifer, which is a pretty substantial pool of groundwater. But given the volume of water that was going to be required to engage in slurry on this scale, the aquifer would be entirely dried up within seven years. And the point the aquifer was gone, the groundwater upon which they depended to be ranchers was going to be gone as well. Essentially, they were going to be living in Navajo land, the lands up north of the Black Hills. That did not sound like a very propitious future for them, okay, which is why Indians have been saying this, okay, we've got common cause. Miners can do this, has happened to Indians before. Indians' way of life have been utterly destroyed by federal policy. Indians have been dispossessed of land. Indians had been, had been, had been, had been, and they're seeing exactly that same scenario unfolding for them. Miners can area that. But it took the punctuation of the federal policy saying, well, hey, we're really going to do this to you, for them to get the message. So yeah, they were real serious. And had the feds come up, every bit convinced that they would have been firing on them just the way they had been firing on us. They saw Indians as a threat to they're locked on the land. They got reservation land very cheap because the BIA leased it for like a dollar an acre to some of them. They saw what Aim was doing is threatening that aspect of their livelihood. But the Etsy pipeline was a vastly greater threat. They figured it out. Well, we can we can work it out with y'all. We can't work it out with the feds. So lessons can be drawn. And sometimes it takes that. The fed, feds have to make the case sometimes before people get the message. But you can always try it. You can lay the groundwork to where when the feds make their move, people are receptive and they, they're cognizant of it much faster than they would be otherwise. 
I hate to say that there's a narrow self-interest involved, but that's a cultural reality here. People are so self-absorbed all the time, talking about their entitlements, that they forget about or ignore everything around them. We make the argument, set the example, create the basis which change will come, but sometimes it takes propellant, often it takes propellant beyond our capacity to be reasonable, persuasive, or anything else. However, you can rely on the feds to uh, <clears throat> do these sorts of things with a great degree of regularity. So just be prepared and seize the time, as Bobby Seale used to say. When they present you the opportunity, move with it. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say, uh, John didn't announce, but he has a radio station, uh, or not radio station, but a radio program, uh, Sunday nights, 9 to 11, <coughs> on 1520 AM. And I know that you had the great uh, pleasure of being on this Sunday, which I heard, uh, yeah, 1520 AM. So it's every Sunday. Uh, please tune in. Let's go. Let's stop native. Uh, um, and also, if, there's, if you want to support that I Don't Know More t-shirts up here, they're $15, or $20 uh, for sale, that the proceeds, the majority of the proceeds go to John and uh, the station. And uh, also, my, I had a question for you. I, I'm really thankful you'd be here. And um, when you talked about, uh, I guess, intellectualism and uh, academia, and how sort of like a, a, a wing of people came out and they discredit revolutionaries, yeah. And they, they leave behind the people who are, you know, sitting in jail right now who had real experiences and they're accredited and they're, uh, you know, brought places to speak and, and so forth. And I just wonder, um, I guess, uh, <laughs> I guess, what, to what extent do you feel, um, I don't know, I guess that's, that's the, main, the main topic. Uh, what's, what's the man's name? Chris Hedges, for example. He, he says, like, a lot, of, he'll say a lot of good things. And like a lot of people can go on board, you know, it's very easy to critique the system that's so bad. And then when it comes to the, like a radical thing, when like we people need support and they need people to stand behind them and we need unity, they just come out and they'll, they'll say the worst things and they're like these really big figureheads and they, you know, and a lot of them are funded from behind the scenes. So I just wanted to bring that up like 350.org or different stuff like that with um, Yeah. Into, into Although that's a somewhat less <laughs> rarefied level than I was talking about, hedges. Okay, that's more in terms of concrete activism. You know, why not critique this fairly lucid and then present you with a masturbatory option of addressing it? Okay, now you know, and so go off and do something to make you feel better about yourself. Well, a humble proposition. Let's feel better about ourselves once we want. Yeah. Now, until then, maybe we had now to be feeling better about ourselves. Maybe we ought to. I think the desire to feel better about ourselves is a sort of a stimulus uh, to move forward. Homie Baba, or that goes, I think, in academic circles, or at least certain of them in cultural studies, that we go sort of like, Homie Baba, Homie Baba, Homie, Homie Baba, Baba, it's a chant. <laughs> you know? You used to run into these people at the airport with orange robes that were chanting things. <laughs> and, and now you got Homie Baba that will explain everything other than reading his books as a counter revolutionary act. And anyone who can actually read a Baba book straight through, I mean, he did, after all, quite deservedly win the award for worst writing <laughs> in the humanities. Anybody who can actually do that deserves some sort of psychiatric treatment of the sort that I cannot really, well, I'm not sure Baba can read Baba and understand what was said. All right, I mentioned Foucault, and actually I find parts of Foucault to be quite useful. But the fetishizing of Foucault is something else again. Because ultimately, I mean, late in his career, he had no doubt reasons for this. I don't want to analyze the man. I'm not a therapist. Okay, but it all became personalized. In the personalization, ultimately, the interpretation comes out that any form of organizational adherence is a form of oppression. And insofar as we are opposed to oppression, the only thing we can do is be individuated, which is to say atomized and running around in, in circles expressing ourselves as individuals. Uh, put that one up against Blackwater sometime, why don't you see, <laughs> see how far you get. Yeah. Okay. Von Conger. Yeah. Or Negris, and he's got a co-author and the name is escaping me, that's I'm having the senior moment. So. <laughs> or maybe I just consider the guy irrelevant. I'm not sure. <laughs> but Antonio Negri's thing on imperialism, 
which he ends up celebrating uh, the implantation of Western forms of democracy in third world settings. Uh, excuse me. That's the neoliberal agenda. Actually, the neocons were championing exportation of democracy. Wasn't that book's script that we're going to conquer Iraq and convert it into a model democracy to transform the entire Middle East? Right. Hey, this is the ultra radical. Ends up in the same position, arguing neoliberal line. Yeah. Is there something wrong with this picture that I'm in? <laughs> or am I deluded? I think when the radicals are arguing, if, if, if you have a self respecting anti imperialist, end up in the same position as Henry Kissinger in 1972, you would have had somebody that nobody on the left, so called, would have given the time of day. And this is taken as the cutting edge avant garde. <laughs> I'm not enough of a conspiracy theorist to uh, suggest that the government thought this stuff up. <laughs> they're not really that right, or they're not that obtuse, one or the other. But I will say, I don't know of a single theorist who has been subjected to any kind of exclusionary pressure in the academy. In fact, they have put substantial resources into cultural studies and such. My own view is because it's utterly diversionary and ultimately neutralizing of any kind of concrete challenge to the state authority and power. Unless my by God revolutionary diet would qualify for that. <laughs> oh, I'm mimicking the oppressor now. I'm going to act out. <laughs> Judith Butler's mimicry with Baba Barros to explain that all the revolutionaries in the third world were doing was mimicking their oppressors and thus were the same, the interchangeable. Colonization and decolonization are equated unless you can think your way into a personal liberation outside the body. Excuse me, later for your personal liberation. Yeah. You got an endowed chair at Harvard. You're liberated, guy. <laughs> but it's a question of bringing the voice of the subaltern into the, the mainstream discourse. I don't know that the subaltern, whatever the subaltern might be in any given instance, is necessarily demanding as a first priority inclusion in the mainstream discourse, whatever that may be. When you mean wogs on the one hand and white folk on the other, why don't you just say so rather than coming up with these things? I'm not sure that's the highest priority in the first place. And there was another point I wanted to take that on to. Put yours now, paper. I'll, I'll, I'll halt with the baba bashing for a moment. But it may occur to me, in which case I will return to it. Now. Okay, so this, this might be a good point to, to jump in. The, the, the worry that I have, or what seems to be true to me of a lot of the people on the left, is that we enjoy reading books and discussing revolutionary theory and bullshit on and on endlessly, but we don't actually do anything fucking concrete and get out and, and, and do it. You know, And I think that there needs to be a shift and, and you know, no disrespect to burning books and their and books on theory, but it, it, it doesn't matter un, un, until you actually do something out on the street and right. then you do it and you judge did it work did it not work are we going in the right direction and then you do something else you know but the 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 discussion the endless theory theorizing <laughs> fucking kills me <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Right on. Sorry. Right on. Um, I think that's what I was trying to say, but you put I it thought right it on was, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> no. Consciousness is essential. Books, theory, including high theory, there is a purpose. It's useful, but it is not a be all end all. And that's the direction it was taken. And theory that ends up confirming the theoretical construction of the oppressor. Let's call it what it is. Thank God. Anybody familiar with the journal Telos? We got one nod, yes, there. <laughs> Okay, this, in the early 70s when Paul McCone started, it was, truly was cutting edge. Brought a lot of Gramsci stuff into English, 
publication and availability brought Boss Ovi stuff. It was a theoretical form that was very useful. Could inform a motion forward. They were not responsible for the so-called turn to theory. But since the turn to theory occurred, they got caught up in that dynamic. Their latest stalking horse is a guy by the name of Carl Schmidt. Carl Schmidt was a preeminent legal theorist for the Nazis. Telos is a left publication. Mussolini came from the left. All right? You got stuff that is crossover that is objectively fascist at this point, still being treated as, a, as progressive. Julia Kristeva. I can run a clinic on this. <laughs> got books talking about justifying Clintonian engagement, NATO's engagement, and so forth in the Balkans. Okay, I'm not even going to get into whether there should have been an intervention in the Balkans or not. Let's just assume that there, maybe there should have been. Just to avoid controversy. <laughs> okay, so there were some untoward things happening in the Balkans back in the 90s. Fine. You read Kristeva, however, I can show you in the Nazi literature the sorts of things she's talking about with regard to the Balkan Slavic populations. She is demeaning and degrading at that level. This is not progressive stuff, and yet she is considered to be an ultra radical critic. This goes beyond celebrating the export of Western style democracy in the third world context and <coughs> thus ending up in the same position as, oh, I don't know, Brzezinski <laughs> or Charles Krauthammer or, you know, we can start running down neocon names if you want to, but I have to start having this gag response when I do that. <laughs> All right. Good this goes beyond. This goes into literal fascist theory, critique of liberal democracy as being somehow or another sleek, chic, and sexy. That's scary to me. It really is. Because that's about one step away from well, some things I see apparent anyway. In the, the revitalization of genetic, uh, eugenics under other names. and <laughs> you Look at the penal colony in the United States. Hmm. I see resemblances to another society from which they're drawing, literally. But they're, on the other hand, or in the process, perhaps a better way of putting it, counting on the fact that nobody recognizes who Schmidt was. Okay? Werner Best resonates not at all. You can draw them and cite them all day long. And you got some peculiar types running around out here like me. People have read a lot of the Nazi literature for reasons that have to do with my work as a foil. And I'm recognizing these close paraphrases and literally they're plagiarizing in some cases. They're just repeating and verbatim and not attributing it to source because they, they're worried somebody might recognize where it's coming from. <laughs> yeah. Well, Hermstein and his uh, partner did the bell curve relied on Nazi eugenicists to support their arguments, they got called on, out on it real fast. But one reason they got called out on it real fast is they were unabashedly right-wingers. These are left-wingers, or ostensible left-wingers doing it. So that's, uh, yeah, I hear what you're saying, but we need to pay attention to this stuff because it filters down in popularized form. And people are thinking, the opposite of what they think they're thinking as a result. This mind twist kind of game is a real effective way of maintaining. We were talking earlier today about whether or not the model for what the uh, U.S. forces of repression do in this country, what the model is as counterinsurgency. No, it's not. It's beyond counterinsurgency. There's precious little insurgency out there to be countered. <laughs> they crushed that some time back. Their point was to make sure it didn't come back. That's to maintain a state of pacification and a state of confusion. The more rarefied, the better. The more intricate and impressive sounding, the more elegant your 
rationalization of inaction or actual collaboration with the powers of oppression. And B, the more effective the pacification will be, the less you'll have to rely on the sharp end. And that goes back to a conversation we were having on the radio. I said they don't use the 7th Cavalry anymore. The more involved in mind warping people to the point of being the opposite of who they want to be. Much more effective, much more insidious if you can pull it off. And they're pulling it off pretty well. Okay. I've seen you laughing at the right time. <laughs> I'm loving it. Thank you so much. You're quite welcome. I have wondered if maybe um, that whole phenomenon you're talking about, this kind of hyper-intellectualization and um, sort of fascist smelling left, you know, uh, I guess you'd have to go and believe at this point, you know, because it's more than been played with. Um, I've been trying to wrap my mind around people that I believe mean really well, but have this idea that like the you know, kind of lumping masses, or, you know, they call them sheeple, and blah, what the fuck, and wait the fuck, and, but not realizing that the delusion is up, as far as I can tell, up where they are, more so than on the ground, where people haven't been perverted by this, you know, learning, <laughs> I guess you could say. Like, how do you speak to that? Because it, it's tough to, you know, suggest without cursing. <laughs> well, I don't see anything wrong with cursing. <laughs> I think um, George Carlin nailed that one pretty well. We had 101 ways to say shit. <laughs> Expressive turn. He could make book on all 101 of them, too, and it was different every time. Yeah, I don't know too many words I can do that with. <laughs> and, you know, if you're doing it just for shock value, so what? There's no shock left in it after Bobby Seale and Dewey Newton and Helder Cleaver got done. Yeah, that's gone, but it also can be literal in sometimes. So, I'm not shy about that. I think just say it what it is, and the way I say it is, I speak in all kinds of venues, or at least have spoken over the years. And university venues are the worst. <laughs> I can give you the 10 automatic questions that will be asked again. Why can't we do? <laughs> I never get that question when talking to a bunch of people with an 8th to ninth grade education on a reservation. Or in Mexico where I doubt they got that. It's understood. Lay out the problem. Let's get clear. Let's agree what the problem is. Okay. The greater the degree of privilege and detachment from the reality of what we're talking about could bring in the degree of, I'm so disempowered. <laughs> You've got all the tools and weapons in the world compared to these other people and you can't figure out what to do. You, who are pursuing higher education at the expense of what? Your imagination? <laughs> <laughs> what can you do? How about you can kill the next cop you see? No, I'm not saying you should. You ask what you could do. Could you do that? Yes. If not, I'll help you get equipped. Now that we've gotten that established, let's work some points in between the pole of total ineffectuality and cop killing. Okay, there might be some other alternatives in there. You could probably do them too. Just why don't you try thinking about it? Put it another way. Why don't you try reading? accepting a little bit of responsibility for your station and act on it, rather than pretending to be so powerless. The most powerless people in the world probably are the fabled 1%. That's how much control the media has on yeah. them. Well, they got them believing that they can't do anything. That's what the problem with everybody. Not everybody, I shouldn't say everybody, but a lot of people. Well, what can you do about the toenail polish color that Nicole Simpson was wearing the night she died. <laughs> yeah. What can you actually do about the bravery of those teachers that took those children into that bathroom in Moore, Oklahoma? I've tried turning on the news twice since I've been on the road. All that's on is Moore, Oklahoma. I mean, I 
turned it off yesterday and drove up here. This morning I turned it off, turned it on in my motel room just before I left, and it was like I hadn't even turned it off. Just continued the sentence. Believe it or not, there are other things happening in the world. Thank you. So, it's not even a question of them being convinced that they have no power to do anything. They can, if, if they're actually taking what's important from the media, this is the kind of gibberish they're dealing with. And the saturation will go on for weeks. I don't know quite when this started. I kind of think it started along about the late 1980s where I was living with somebody called John Benet Ramsey. Yeah. You know, and after yeah, a week of non-stop Jean Benet, I'm saying, so Shirley Temple got killed. I'm real sorry, but my God. <laughs> and you know, that morning she got killed, there was a little black girl about eight miles down the road from the location of the Ramsey residence in Brewfield, Colorado, whose mother beat her to death. That was straight up, no question. She didn't happen to have blonde hair, one of the beauty pageant type, she was irrelevant. That warranted about two column inches in the Rocky Mountain News, and that's all the coverage you've got. And that sort of plays into my overall thing that has been working on and festering in me for as long as I've been conscious, is that they can say what they want. The great day. And the great day often includes the great us. But the devaluation of brown-skinned others is so glaring so much of the time and so little. That was a perfectly real little girl. Irrelevant. The icon was what was important. And John Bonet, by the way, was a real little girl too. She wasn't what was projected. No child is. So she was abused even after death in, in the media hype. But how many repetitions of that? And when did you ever see in one of these screaming national foci anybody other than a little, little blonde girl being a You ever seen a little black girl? Latino girl? Hell no. No. <laughs> Never. In my experience, maybe I missed something. I'm not always, I can't watch it all the time. <laughs> but I don't think so. I don't think so. And that repetition, you know, that, that imparts a sense of value of what's important and what's not. And it's virtually a subliminal process, although it's blatant in the way they put it out. The valuation that attends it is assimilated people off of the subliminal way. And so, yeah, your humanity is impaired because you really aren't conscious, even when someone tells you. Madeleine Albright can go on 60 minutes and tell you that a half million plus of rocky children died needless deaths, and everybody yawns and sets up the next meeting for at the cappuccino bar, <laughs> has their power lunch, okay, does whatever they do. What they don't do is respond to that in outrage in public demonstrations. It's not until you got U.S. troops going into Iraq that all of a sudden you start seeing the mass demonstrations. And I'm not saying necessarily there shouldn't have been mass demonstrations about Bush's war. But I want to know where they were when an entire generation of brown-skinned children in another country were reclaimed the worth the price by Madeleine Albright to enforce the Bush. I mean, she's Clinton's at the time, UN ambassador, later Secretary of State. But what she was enforcing and what the Clintonians were enforcing was something said by George H.W. Bush, which is the world's got to learn that what we say goes. If not, we'll starve your children to death. Best response I ever heard to the question from 2001. What do we do to protect ourselves against the recurrence of 911? It's from my wife, Nazu Saito, who's on a radio program. She said, well, I suggest maybe we stop killing your babies. What do you think? <laughs> Michael, 
but that, that's why I can't buy into this self-serving privileged station. We're going to come to grips with genocide by engaging in polite protests and hoping the media is going to give us. But did the media ever give you a fair shake? Or when did it ever matter? If they did, you know, you respond to the genocide in that way, somebody eventually going to take offense, say, you killed my baby. See how it feels and see if you want to keep doing that. And guess what? By any reasonable calculus, that's entirely fair. You act like Adolf Eichmann, you might get treated like Adolf Eichmann. Oh, I don't mean you're shipping Jews to the concentration camps or the extermination center at Auschwitz. I mean, you're applying your proficiencies to something that results in mass death elsewhere, among others. Do so either knowingly or with reason to know, okay? For personal advancement and personal gain, that's the moral equivalent of Eichmann. Not that you had to be wearing the same uniform and look as goofy as that guy did. <laughs> it's not that liberal. Presidential, presidential schools went for a hundred years. Hmm? Presidential schools went for a hundred years. Yeah. And everybody, in fact, even Native people were complicit in them. Oh yeah. They existed for a hundred years, and, and there was a fifty percent mortality rate. So maybe it wasn't a gas chamber, but it certainly was a. Hmm. Uh, tuberculosis chamber. Right. Well, somewhere between a third and a half of people who died in Eastern Europe during the processing died of tuberculosis, typhus, and things like that as well. And the Nuremberg Court uh, felt quite rightly that that was as culpable a form of death as being gassed or shot. Yeah. You got 50th percentile attrition in the residential schools. I use a Canadian term because that encompasses both boarding schools and industrial. The worst of the Nazi concentration camps was in terms of mortality in Mount Thousand. That was 62 percent. Not much difference, really, to think about it between. 50% and 62%. My thousand was all adults, however. Boarding schools was children. But we want to talk about the horrors of the camps in comparison to things. Anybody got a wild idea of how many survivors there were of the U.S. chain gang prior to 1934 when they were abolished? They've been restarted lately, but they were abolished for a while in 1934. <coughs> How many survivors of a 10-year sentence to a chain gang there were in the United States? You're right, there weren't many. There were in fact none. No survivors. There were people that spent 10 years in Dachau. <clears throat> the concentration camp, extermination camp, different things. They're deliberately conflated here because the U.S. ran a lot of concentration camps. Four Indians, four Confederates, four Japanese Americans, and Japanese, and so on. Fairly long list of concentration camps. And they were called concentration camps. When they were Roosevelt called them concentration camps. But when they made the grand apology during the 90s, they decided the concentration camp was not an appropriate term, despite the fact that the people who did it knowingly referred to them as concentration camps because of the connotations of deliberate extermination associated with the Nazi camps. Uh, excuse me. The Operation Reiner camps and their successors were a small number of facilities that were dedicated to extermination separate from the concentration camp system subject to a completely different chain of command. So, your purpose would be to educate people that Auschwitz and Sobibor and those camps were not concentration camps. The concentration camps were the ones like the Americans ran. Can, okay. can, can you draw an analogy with mass incarceration today? With, with what was done? These are, aren't these concentration camps where uh, yes. most, most minority people are being disabled sure. and crippled and then kicked back into society? 
Sure. And if you go back to reconstruction amendments, slavery was abolished except for duly adjudicated felons. Okay? Well, you just take one in three black males between 18 and 25, say, and railroad them through a plea bargain into a prison and they're enslaved legally despite the abolition of slavery. Okay? You make the same argument with regard to American Indians. You can make a very similar argument with regard to Latinos who are also disproportionately represented, although not so much so as either blacks or American Indians. I'm not quite sure with Asian because they divide out the populations as they don't tend to do well any of the other food groups. Oh yeah, it's the four food groups that we always talk about here. <laughs> as if there were not more complexity and diversity of the populations in that. Southern blacks, for example, don't have exactly the same experience as they do in the metropolitan areas of the north, but we get some totalizing aggregate statistical accounting of the experience of blacks. Hell, I don't know <laughs> how we're going to do this. Under what legal regime? Huh? We're going to do it under the Southern legal regime, one drop rule. If you have a drop of black blood, any black ancestry, no matter how remote, you're black. Well, hell, the Ku Klux Klan's black on that one. <laughs> you know? Or we do it like with Indians, which in the 1880s and 90s, and even more so in the other part of the 20th century, if you weren't half-blood or more, you were considered not to be an Indian. Of course, you weren't considered to be a white either, so I'm not quite sure what the hell it was you were supposed to be. <laughs> oh, really? Well, in South Carolina and North Carolina, they actually uh, stopped letting uh, anybody uh, from being an Indian or people call themselves Native. They had to be identified as black. Yeah. Yeah. Or... Huh? I'm just hearing discussion where folks are talking about genocide as something um, is being passed or something that affects only African Americans. And I would argue that genocide is very current and it's global. And I would I would argue very that gen I would argue that genocide is global currently. Um, as yeah. fundamentalists and conservatives have um, gained alliances and a lot of white folk have gained alliances globally and our media is not reporting what is happening globally. I would argue that in Africa uh, with a land grab, uh, men are being denied self-respect to work. It's affecting the relationships in Africa. Uh, Bush denied contraceptions to uh, protect them from AIDS. South America, the military buildup that our um, government has not been really reporting since the Reagan years, and even with the scandal of Iran Contra, it continued in the Bush presidency where it wasn't reported. And in terms of this country, women's rights, yeah. I call that a genocide. How do you call that a genocide? Well, uh, you haven't reported this country is saying that wait, 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 this country is saying that women's rights are negotiable. Okay. And I would argue women as creators, when you uh, start uh, sterilizing, making sterilization free, which in the Native movement uh, is very much aware of, but so are white women from the 1800s and later in the 1900s. But currently what's happening with women's rights in terms of health care, um, reproductive health care access, abortion rights, um, it's saying that women aren't capable of making their own decisions and being in control of their own life. And when you start saying that someone can't control their own body, you're saying that they're, you know, not capable. And it's like when you start talking about men controlling reproduction, um, it's a civil rights issue. And if you look at violence against women in this country, all the trends of what's happening with women, in my view, it's a genocide. I'm not disagreeing with anything you're saying, but I'm asking how this comes up to genocide, which is to bring about the dissolution and disappearance of the target group. Well, uh, violence women's rights, rights are not... eroded, they're showing that violence against women is increasing. So if you look at women of color and what's happening, <coughs> you mentioned... Uh, when you were talking about how a young African-American child was ignored, the genocide that's been occurring in the urban centers 
It's been going on since the Reagan era, probably since the 70s and 60s. Come out of genocide against women, never. I'm, take sterilization, because I think you're on solid ground with that being a category of genocide. Oh, well, pay, you know, Medicaid pays for sterilization, but not for anything else. Let me finish. Okay? It's not bringing dissolution and disappearance of females as such, it's bringing dis dis disappearance and dissolution of target group as such. That's males and females alike. It's a violation of women's rights, no question. But it's not genocide against women, it's genocide against the target group. Whether that's African Americans, Puerto Ricans, half the Puerto Rican women were, te were sterilized during the 1970s. Poor black women in the South are native women for sure. 42% on record in just a five year period of time. That's genocide. But it's not genocide against women. It might, be genocide, it might be genocide through women. Yeah, I would that's, that's the point. Pharmaceutical kind of companies, health insurance companies, the eugenics movement start saying when women can have children or when they can't. It's a gross violation of rights, but it is not genocide, and one should not use the term in a way that is contrary to the meaning of the term. Define genocide. Define, well, I kind of just did. I, I can, genocide is any policy undertaken to bring about the dissolution and ultimate disappearance of a target group. All right, now they got a list of protected classes in the genocide convention. And it's truncated, largely as a result of a little argument between the so-called free world and the Soviet bloc. Soviet bloc caused political aggregates to be removed, okay, from the list of protected classes. Uh, the United States went after various aspects of culture and economy. So what you end up with is genocide, any policy undertaken bring about the destruction in whole or in part of a racial, I'm not sure if the order is correct here, racial, ethnical, national, or religious group as such. You got it. I think she's kind of confused with, with yeah. gender. And One marriage. Oh, I'm not confused. Uh, you got five criteria under that, killing members of the group on the basis of their membership in the group. Well. I know a lot of men in this country are saying women are capable of making their own decisions. Well, I'm not but one that's of not, but that's not I'm just saying that... Oh. Because nobody wants to wipe women off the face of the earth. Really? Oh. Yeah, really. <laughs> really? No, they don't. They may want to use women to wipe a targeted group off the face of the earth. Yeah. Through, uh, through every one mentioned of the You mentioned the brute births is the fourth of five criteria, okay? But that's that got to do with bringing about dissolution and disappearance of the group. My God, nobody's trying argue, to bring about the disappearance of women altogether. I would argue that when a president of the United States gets into office in less than a week, denies protection of AIDS to an entire continent, um, for That's me, as a woman, the to say that there's men not out the there, women of the continent. I, well, there's women on that continent and men. Yes. And I would say, as a woman, that it's really not confusing for me to say that if I'm denied access to health care, and that a group of men in a corporation can make those decisions on my behalf, <coughs> and they know better, that it's really not confusing that when the President of the United States attempts to kill an entire continent, that it's really not confusing for me to think that there's a lot of men out there who don't like women. Yes. <laughs> there are a whole lot of. So why is that? Little rascals. <laughs> why is that would be a whole different yeah. conversation. <laughs> but we get into it. <laughs> the only thing at issue is here whether the abridgment of rights, outright violation and denial of rights of women, qualifies as crime of genocide. There's all kinds of other criminal violations of rights that occur. However, I think it was rather succinctly put, there is to my knowledge, and you haven't made a case to the contrary, nobody is attempting to eliminate women as a group. Period. It's just subjugating. You can take out the entire population of Africa, and there's going to be a lot of women, but they're taking out the men as well. And it's a punctuation of both. You can sterilize American Indian women, that's a violation of their rights, but the point is to prevent births 
both male and female, among American Indians, so the target group is American Indians, male and female. This is the mechanism used. They used that against the Jews as well. But there has never been a policy aimed at eradication of women and leaving an all-male society anywhere, to my knowledge. And if you can point to an example of where that's true and not that, hey, they're violating and denying me health care and therefore it's genocide, it's not. It could be a crime against humanity. Okay? And I would argue that it is. But that does not mean that it's genocide. Genocide is not an all-purpose word for violation of rights or things you don't like and things we should oppose. Okay? No one's trying to make you disappear. They may kill you as an individual, but not as a protected class called female. This society would last about 20, 20 months without women. I would argue that there is been lots of war waged on women in this country. And, Waging a war is also not genocide necessarily. In some men's mind, it is. I would do, disagree. Do you have anything to offer? I'm going to break this, this off in a minute, but I'm going to ask one last time. If you've got anything to offer by way of a concrete plan to eliminate women, per se, so they no longer are here, so that we have a woman-free society. Females are gone. I think that there's Do you that have that something you can point one to? One in three women physically assaulted. It's been a That's consistent statistic since the 1970s. In other words, you're saying you United don't have States one to point to. Anything about them. The rights of women are violated all the time in abysmal ways, but you have nothing to point to and to continue to talk about other kinds of violation of right does not redeem the situation and all I'm suggesting to you is you ought to call things by the right name. This is a violation of human rights of the first order, often, the examples you've cited, but to call it genocide is self-discrediting and it means the term genocide. We need a little bit of precision in language and a rhetorical use of a term that has utmost gravity is not constructive. Gynecology wasn't particularly constructive either, and that was a friend of mine. I actually liked Mary Daly, but that was a stupid argument to make, as she was trying to suggest the burning of the witches was a form of, she called it gynocide, the genocide of women. What it was, it was the destruction of the last remnants of the indigenous pagan traditions in Europe, because women held the power and the spiritual knowledge. Would you say that slavery is a form of genocide? Excuse me? Would you say that slavery is a form of genocide? Genocide, yeah, slavery can be a form of genocide. Transatlantic slave trade had a genocidal impact on Africa because it took God knows how many, 100 million, I see often is the estimate, people out of West African society. That decimates society, brings about the dissolution of the societies and leads to the direction of disappearance. And there's a lot of societies that existed at the advent of the slave trade that no longer are functional in the aftermath of that. Slavery in terms of its implementation in the United States? No. The object was not to bring about the dissolution and disappearance of slaves, it was to extract labor from them. But the impact on Africa itself, yes, that was genocidal. What would you call the systematic dissolution of nature of, of those, those, those European pagan constructs or whatever? I mean, I, it, fair enough that it's not genocide, but what, the, what does that mean to culturally destroy uh, uh, the, the organizing framework of a culture, to destroy nature, to destroy a woman's, you know, you know. That's targeted to society and matriarchy being an organizing principle, an institution of a society that gives it shape and coherence. It's aimed at the society as a whole. Okay? Yeah. Just I mean, not the legs out of it, uh, but yeah, but it's not just women that's affected, and it's not designed to bring about the disappearance of women that would lead you to say it's genocide against women, it's genocide against the entire society in a cultural sense. And that's a very real sense. That was control of people, not eliminate them in that sense. Well, and I would argue a traditional European, non-Christian non European societies weren't patriarchal. Yeah, well, they they were more they were tribal societies. 
very much like NATO societies, in which men and women existed alongside of each other and did things and shared power. And it threatened, it threatened the patriarchal designs of the, of the Christian church. And that's why it has to be done away with it. Just as NATO spirituality has to be done away with it. Yeah, the disempowerment of indigenous women here too. And those weren't all matriarchal, often it's matrilineal. And there's a division. But matrifolk? Oh, yeah, matrifolk. Well, matrilineal, matrifolk of both. Not necessarily matriarchal, although you probably had some of that as well. And all of that got demolished, but one may notice that biologically native women are still here. So it's aimed at the society and the social structure, in the sense that women can coin the term. It wasn't aimed at women as a population group to bring about dissolution and disappearance, to destroy their roles. Their power. Yeah, I'm wondering what you think that we should do and can do to fight climate change. Well, you could put pressure for them to outlaw things like love the activity I see of driving up here for lack one. Okay, release as much energy to curtailing the gluten uh, content of that you do on plastering no smoking signs on every flat surface in North America, <laughs> including coffee bar sitting in the middle of parking lots where the cars are idling right next to your table. <laughs> yeah. Yo. <laughs> Yo. And that's not quite the same as the point that you were making, but let's try to get a grip on things and stop running off the edge of reality into fads and fetishes and declaring victory over something that didn't exist other than, oh, maybe poor people's social practices. Yeah? I'm trying to feature a blues bar with, oh, I don't know, Sonny Terry and Browning McGee getting their start in that entire cultural ambience that occurred there while they were busy making the environment safe for our kids to have chocolate malls and putting ferns. Okay? You understand they've expunged the entire cultural in the name for our own good. For our own good. I went to Buddy Guys on uh, was it Beale Street in Memphis. Not Buddy Guys, D.D. King's Buddy Guys in Chicago. Chicago got Buddy Guy too, okay? But he doesn't serve malts like D.D. King does on Beale Street, for God's sake. And they've turned it into digital, it's real yuppie friendly now. Uh huh. And chocolate malt's for real. You can't get a shot of whiskey anymore because you wouldn't want to expose our. And not a single blues musician shows up. <laughs> Why? They've eradicated the entire environment. And they were entitled to that environment, boys and girls. That was the spirit of the place in question. Exactly. Hmm. That whole idiot. Homogenized. I'm sorry if it's offensive to your sensibilities, but guess what? You can buy a CD and stay home. <laughs> <laughs> that way, the CD, there will be somebody out there inured to the social mores of homogenization that's capable of making the music that informs the CD that you're listening to in your stereo and your smoke free home. <laughs> Great place it's called the Vortex in Atlanta. They got matchbooks that have the rules of the house, one of which is if you feel the need to absolutely control your environment, stay home. <laughs> you know? Understand, this isn't that kind of place. And if you don't like it, you're free to leave. There's the door. But you that worked real well. You could have places that catered to different sensibilities. So much so that they had to just outlaw a whole range of sensibilities. Oh, it was for your own good. When was the last time you remember the federal government passing this comprehensive legislation for something actually resembling your own good? Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. I'll give you a good question. Here's a good example of, uh, okay. of uh, just craziness. Uh, Andrew Cuomo, when he was pitching his state of the budget address uh, a couple of months ago, suggested that one of the things that he could do to stimulate the economy in New York was to uh, have tax-free booze shops. So shops that could sell alcohol tax-free, perhaps even on the rest areas of the thruway. Uh, as a means the rest areas of the, rest area is the throughway. So as a means to stimulate the, uh, the, the wine, spirits, and beer industry of New York State, at the same time that they're trying to shut down reservation smoke shops that are, that are selling native-made uh, tobacco products tax-free. I mean, that's the that's 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 your governor says, do drink and drive. <laughs> Good for the economy. Yeah. As long as it increases state revenue. Exact <laughs> question for you. Just one of these idle questions. This is a pop quiz. We'll see who passes. How many pounds of plutonium are missing from U.S. inventories on record? What tons? What tons? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you got it. You're within a couple hundred pounds. That was a wild guess. <laughs> well, it was a pretty good wild guess. Are you sure you didn't hear it somewhere before? You got some. <laughs> You're about 200 pounds off the, the rounded off figure. Okay. I'll give you a chance to redeem yourselves. He's the only one who scored quick. Okay, somebody else might want to score something here. How many pounds of plutonium would take to kill every human being on the planet? Two. Less than one. Uh, uno. 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 This is Rosalie Bertel did the math on this one. If you could, plutonium vaporizes, since it turns into, <coughs> oh, it makes talcum powder look very coarse. Okay, it doesn't, it burns and upon exposure to air. If you can distribute that one pound of burnt plutonium evenly at high, at six feet in the atmosphere around the planet, we would kill every single human being with that one pound. There's four tons of the stuff missing from U.S. inventories alone. John, what's his face that first synthesized the plutonium in the United States predicted in 1954 when Eisenhower announced the Peace Platinum program that if you proliferate plutonium in reactors at the level you're talking about given current and foreseeable states of engineering for containment, you will have an epidemic of lung cancer in the United States within 10 years of actualizing the program. Well, you got the epidemic of lung cancer. Now, you got to blame that on something, don't you? <laughs> Far better. What's the strategic value of tobacco? You remember those B-2 bombers flying over Baghdad and they were throwing packs of pell-mells if they were Rockies on the ground below? Deadly stuff. No. With depleted uranium, plutonium, nuclear weaponry, reactors, and all the rest of that, now you're talking strategic. And you're also talking about government liability in these sorts of things. There's a fair amount of documentation on this, but it's not accurate because, after all, the same people that would tell you within a tenth of a decimal point how many people are going to die next year of smoking-related lung maladies will tell you there's never been a recorded case of lung cancer precipitated by plutonium anywhere in the United States. If you believe one, you need to believe the other. Okay? Go out and spoon up your plutonium and have a real nice day in your smoke-free zone. There's a video on YouTube that shows all the nuclear explosions just for test. Yeah. I mean, it's like 1,500 or 1,400, something like that. Mm -hmm. And only two of them were used in war, and all the other ones were tested. Yeah. Yeah. You need to think about some somewhere. of this stuff. That went somewhere. Well, I'm exploded by the U.S. I to Hanford, and Hanford, for God's sake. They leaked enough heavy metal out of their leaching ponds to irradiate the shellfish at the mouth of the Columbia River to the point where guys ate an oyster dinner. <laughs> Downstream and went back to work at Hanford and they triggered the, the alarms as they were trying to enter the plant. <laughs> yeah, they were that irradiated from their stomach for dinner that they'd eaten eight hours before. Okay, as a smoke-free zone, by golly. <laughs> mm -hmm. Recently, 
those signs have been applied recently. This was after all the nuclear proliferation was known. They hadn't talked about the radioactive iodide res uh, releases. They were testing what the effects of radiation would be in windblown plumes. So they re deliberately released radioactive iodides. Okay? You got a epidemic of thyroid cancer downwind. They're studying very closely to figure out if there's any correlation between uh, releasing the iodides and the thyroid cancer. Huh. I don't know about you, but I'm an old guy and I learned in eighth grade biology that iodide and thyroid kind of hook up the human anatomy. I think an eighth grader could figure this one out, but we've been studying this intensively. Intensively, you understand, a great deal of funding, vast expenditures of paper for more than 20 years. Meanwhile, these guys are all dying, and that's the point because there won't be, once they discover there, yeah, it probably wasn't correlation, not necessarily a causative effect, but perhaps correlation. They should be compensated, don't be by the compensated. This stuff is going on all the time. And people are actually embracing it as a socially progressive thing. The government's on my side. Well, this one I agree with. Yo, if they're doing it, why aren't you wondering why? Oh, because it meets your social expectations and preference and therefore state imposition is okay? Hmm. I had that particular argument, the last one I was addressing there, what was not just something I pulled out of the air. Self-described anti-authoritarian collective in, they were based out of Portland, Oregon. So, I mean, that, how do we get outside of talking to ourselves, track actual working people and such to what we're talking about? I said, you might probably have to stop talking to them, go out and intersect with them something where they already assigned meaning. They had just passed no smoking ordinance in Portland which meant all the places where the working guys went after work to have their past blue ribbon or whatever it is they have, all of a sudden were verboten in terms of social practice, so they needed to figure what? In case some yuppie had a flat tire in front of the place, wanted to use the pay phone and had to be smoke free to accommodate them. Yeah, I bet if you went down there and challenged that, you'd get response. You know, it may not be your priority issue, but I bet it would resonate with them and you establish a basis of communication you can take. This is how you do organizing. You might need to be a drag racer someday instead of arguing old bicycles are the wave of the future. <laughs> okay, because that's what these guys are doing. So you connect with them where they are and work it out from there. And I swear to Christ, in unison they said, but we agree with that ordinance. Oh yeah, you're an anti-authoritarian. Yeah. Every time they step on something that you think should, you should be able to do, you're all outraged. But when it's something you agree with, it's okay to step on somebody else. That's not anti-authoritarian, that's privilege talking. And the answer to your question in light of that sensibility is there's nothing you can do to attract working people. You canceled yourself out before you start. All you're going to be is a missionary going down and preaching to them about what they should think and what they should value and how they should act. Well, you're probably going to get right where you can expect to get with that approach. Yeah. So, on that note, I'm starting to fade a little bit up here. <laughs> Thank you all. Like I said, hardcore. Hang in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.